flying at me. Well, the Word of God tells me that he whom the Son sets free... Oh, I'm going to give that to you again. He whom the Son sets free... How many of you are free in Jesus? Now, this week, for many of you, for many of us, there have been attacks galore. Anybody in the last month feel like there's been an attack over your life, that you've been bad on a, a, a few things? I, I want to, yeah, I know, both hands, both feet, you know, we're, we're, we're in there. Uh, I, I need to declare something else to you this morning. You, you ready for this? If, if you don't receive, thank you, Miss Jeannie. Anybody else ready for this? All right. If you don't receive anything else this morning, receive this. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can, can, can I just speak that over our lives today, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I've got to tell you, because of that, the Bible tells me that when I submit to God, that then I resist the devil. And you got to listen to these next few words, the Bible says, and he must flee from our lives. So I got to tell you this morning, as we've submitted to God and declared the Lordship of Jesus over our lives, we stand and say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We resist you today by that power, by that authority. Now get ready, devil, because according to the word of God, you have got to go. Am I ready just to grab hold of that and uh, for, for your life and live this? I want you to know something. We said this last week, and it's important to understand this. When you come to God and you are give your life to Christ, coming to Christ, being saved is an event in your life. You come and you don't have to get saved every single week. You don't have to come get saved this week. Then you mess up next week. Come get saved again. No, Christ comes and he's died for your sins. He's made the way. We come and we receive the work of Christ and accepting Christ in my life is a one-time event. Becoming like Christ is a journey that I walk through. And so every single day we become more and more like Christ. And so you have to understand something that submitting myself to God is not a one time event. That is a daily event. Sometimes it is an hourly event. Sometimes you're going through things and you have to flat out remind yourself about every three minutes. Wait a minute. I am God's. We got you have to set yourself in time out. Self, you, you just need to sit over here for a little bit because you are out of control. And so bringing ourselves back in this understanding of resetting our hearts, as we did last week, we spoke of that, is bringing our lives back into submission to the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. Where my heart has been away. We've gone our own ways, the, the Bible speaks of. We, we bring our lives back and we say, Father, today I'm bringing my heart under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm resetting my heart. Now, if you were with us last week, I, I want, or if you weren't with us last week, I want to encourage you to go back and, and take a look at, uh, uh, at the, the service. We, uh, we began to share this, and we shared with you that all over the nation right now, there are churches that are going through this set of, of teachings where we're resetting our lives, because I don't believe that we are just one church, 150 people here in Severn, Maryland. You understand that you are part of the body of Christ. Let me get that in your spirit today. Now, I got about 15 of you that are with me. So nudge the person next to you and, and, and look at them. Just, just let them know. Wake up. You can talk back today. Be involved. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Remember, Dwayne is sitting here in Pastor Francis's place today with a say it again portion. It's uh, Pastor Francis and his family are, uh, are down in Florida on vacation. Three boys at Disney World. Feel free to pray for him, because uh, those are three active boys. And I, uh, I said, brother, you are going to need a vacation from this vacation with, uh, when you come back. So as you saw, pretty much everybody within our uh, um, worship team decided to go on vacation this week also. So we lost all of our, uh, our, our lead instrumentalists. So uh, yours truly took the keyboard this morning, and we're, we're all stepping up to do whatever we need to do, right? We, uh, we get through this, uh, this summer together. 
<laughs> but as we understand, as we're going through this, we have to understand that we are not just the church and it's not just us four and no more we are connected to the body of christ the body of christ is large the body of christ is on the movement jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it so you've got to understand that as we go next week down to the washington monument that we're not going as one church and well we're not sure what all these other folks are doing around here no we're going as the body of christ that's why it's so important to be involved in something like this because every once in a while something comes along that's bigger than yourself that you simply have to be a part of and say yes I stand to join with my brothers and sisters all over this world to see Jesus lifted high in this day and in this hour are you ready to be more and live for something greater than just yourself I believe that's the call of God on our lives. And so we're joined together. And I believe that all over this nation, God is resetting his church. We talked about what that looks like to restore to its original design, to its purpose, to uh, its original intent, to set again, to reestablish, to reorganize and retune. We talked to you about retuning a, a piano if something is out of alignment. After the service, my mother came up to me and she reminded me uh, of even going to the, the chiropractor. And one of the things some of you have gone through where they will tell you that if your hips or shoulders are out of alignment, it can throw everything else off in your life. It can throw off the, the length of your legs and how you walk and all the rest of it. If your body is out of alignment, it will change everything. Can I tell you this morning that if our spirits and our hearts are out of alignment, it will change everything in our lives. And so we talked about getting our hearts back into alignment with God and, uh, and what that looked like. We, uh, we read through Psalm uh, 24, uh, 1 through 10, and we spoke of the, the Ark of the Covenant as, as David went after the, the presence of God and what it was to, to bring that presence and bring the glory of God back to Israel. And what I want to so say something over your lives this morning, I believe that one of the things that God is doing today is he's bringing back his glory his presence in, into the church where we don't just gather together for times of, of, of socializing. We're not just as a, as a fellowship joined together, but I believe that there's a, a glory of God that, that's falling on his people. And we're, we're searching. No, we're not bringing back a, a, a physical Ark of the Covenant but we're bringing back the presence of God. We're honoring and reverencing God's presence. And we're, we're consecrating ourselves once again. And we told you, God's been speaking to us. In the coming weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna share with you how, what God's doing in, in changing our hearts is even entering God's presence. That when we come in, we consecrate ourselves before the Lord. And I believe that God, just like God spoke to Joshua, get ready because God is going to do something great in your midst, something that you have not seen before. And so we're getting ready for, how many of you are ready for the move of God in your lives? How many of you are ready for the move of God in your families? We're believing for the move of God within our, within our country and we're, we're standing together. And so as we, we've spoken about this, God resetting our hearts, today we want to begin to, uh, to move towards uh, the next area of our life that I believe that God wants to reset. God wants to bring a reset to our minds. Because when you begin to set your minds on God, things begin to change. We, uh, all right, somehow we got off onto the wrong thing here, guys. If you're able to get back... <laughs> Okay, so do me a favor, put it on the sermon and don't touch it, okay? Okay, we're, uh, boy, we had a really good video for you today that was going to introduce this, and uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it set up, worked well. You know what? I watched it this morning, Tony. It was good. I, uh, they're, uh, they're working on it back there, but let, let me... Uh, let me share this with you just a, just a little bit this morning. When God begins to do something, ha have you ever noticed that he, he speaks to our heart and then a battle goes on in our lives? Have you ever made a decision on a Sunday morning or at a time at a church or a conference and then walked away and had a struggle living that decision out? 
Now, I, I want you to know something. You're not alone. Right. All of us are in that same boat. Why? Because there is a battle that still goes on in our lives. We spoke about it two weeks ago. We, we looked at Romans chapter 8 and we saw that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. Now, remember, here's part of the reason that we encourage you to go back and to, to listen to the, the messages that have been brought. Everything we do builds on the next week. And our goal is not to just bring you a good message. Our goal is that you would grow in Christ. Thank you for the five of you that are interested in that. See, now I take your speaking back to me as confirmation. You, so you're getting on the same page with me. So our goal is for you to grow in Christ. Oh, good. I'm glad you're here with me today. It's a good day. So as we do this, what we've got to do is, is allow God. We say, okay, Lord, how do we do this? How do we begin to practically walk? And if you've ever been to Calvary Chapel uh, before, you'll know this. We believe in a preaching that brings a behavior change into our lives. Because God sets us in, and I want to read a couple of scriptures to you this morning, because as we talk about this resetting our minds, God gives us a, uh, something to shoot for. And this is what the Bible says. If you have your word with you this morning, turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8. I have no idea what's going to go up on the screen in front of you this morning, so take your Bibles and roll with me. Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8 this morning. I'm going to read this to you. Here's what Paul is speaking to the Philippian church. Now listen to what he says. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. How many of you believe that that's good wisdom, good advice? Good, that's half of you. I'm going to give it a try again. How many of you believe that's good wisdom and good advice? Yeah. All right. Now, the reason why you're comfortable in saying that is because God spoke those things. We didn't read this from a Tony Robbins book or some sort of motivational thing. This is God saying us, hey, guys, here's what I want you to fix your mind on. Begin to think about these things. How many of you have heard that scripture before? How many of you have memorized that scripture growing up? How many of you have lived that scripture 100% of the time? Ah, uh, we went from amens to ahs. Absolutely. Why? Because there's a battle in our minds, isn't there? That go because it's wonderful to fix your thoughts on those things when you're with nice people who are treating you nicely and you're in church, you're in a good place, maybe with your family. But it is a challenge when we're in challenging places in the world. And when we have challenging things go on, sometimes things begin to swirl in our minds. And I want to share this with you because sometimes we feel like we're alone in this. You got to understand something. What the enemy always does. You see, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of the schemes or strategies of the devil. Listen to what he did. Jesus was out in the wilderness fasting. No eating for 40 days. 40 nights. The devil comes to him, and the very first temptation that he offers him, how many of you remember that? Yeah. Turning these stones into bread. How many of you believe that Jesus may have been hungry? Yeah. You know, he lived in his physical body. He went 40 days without eating. Sometimes I go 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Four hours. What's for lunch? What's for dinner? Forty days does not compute. That, that's not, so he goes forty days, and so the devil comes to him and brings him something that is of a real feeling. You, you gotta catch us, because sometimes we think, well, you know, I, 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 devil's just throwing all kinds of things at me. No, he's specific and strategic in your life. And he will use real things, but he'll begin to turn. And that's why he's called the deceiver. He'll begin to turn those things. And what you'll find in your mind is things will begin to build up on the inside of you. Right. Have you ever had somebody wrong you or do something wrong? And you begin to 
think on that wrong or that injustice or that hurt. And the more you think about it, all of a sudden you begin to become like a lawyer in your mind. You begin to make a case and build a case and you go back, well, you know what? They did this a week ago. Before you know it, if you don't stop your mind, you have gone back five years of everything that person has done that when they walk past you, when they turned and, and didn't acknowledge you, all of a sudden you've got this case. And so when you come and walk by that person, they may be looking at you as, hey, we had a little bit of a disagreement the other day. You're walking by them like, baby, you've offended me for the last five years and you are out of my life. Yeah, anybody know what I'm talking about? So what the devil wants to do is he wants to build those things up in your mind. And so while we have this spirit that, that is in us that Christ has made new, we've got sometimes an unregenerated mind. And I've got to tell you, we've got to get real. We talked about being real people, having a real Jesus and living and walking in a real church. You've got to understand, sometimes folks are saved, but we are in more shackles than people in the world. Come on, can we be honest today? Because we've been so we've come to the altar and we've given our lives to God, but we haven't understood what it is to renew our minds in the word. And so we go about coming to church on a Sunday morning and go out and are so angry and we don't understand it because we don't live with the knowledge of God living through us. We just kind of live as the world does and we don't understand that the devil is piling on you from all the real things that are going on in your life. Remember, just like Jesus really was hungry, you might really have something that was wrongly done to you, but the devil will take it, and man, he will stir that puppy over and over and, and whip you into a frenzy to get you to push that person out of your life. Come on, we, we, we there together? And so we understand that we come back to the word of God and God says, and now dear brothers, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable. Yes, yes, yes. And sometimes we say, I don't want to. <laughs> the truth is I'm too angry and I'm too hurt and I don't want to think nice things about that person. Hey, can we just be honest for a second? You ever been in a place where you didn't want to think nice things about somebody? And God, think on these things that are pure and noble, of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. And so we have this standard of God. And we have this reality of where we live. Let, let's talk about that just a, a little bit this morning as we talk about resetting our minds. How many of you think it's important to reset your mind and what God and what God wants? I believe it's crucial for us. Now, David cried out with this in uh, in Psalms, and uh, oh, that's right. If you guys could follow me today, if you can, Psalms 19, verse 14 says this. If you're taking notes, Psalm 19, 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing or be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, I read that out of the, the New Living Translation this morning. Um, you have to understand what, what David's crying out. David's crying out, look, God, it, it's not just about my actions, but I, I want to cry out to you about my, my heart issues. Remember, we, we talked about that last week, re resetting our hearts. Let the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, you, you recognize that what we meditate on is going to change the words of our mouth. Come on, it, it, you know what? It, it, if I uh, start thinking about all my brother Ken Hales has done to me over the last five years and when he walked past me and when he did this and when he did that, if that's a meditation in my heart, when I look at Ken, I am either going to be as phony as, you know what? I, oh, Ken, are you blessed today, brother? And see, we're good at doing that as church folk, aren't we? Amen. Look, shake, we give the... The holy hug, yeah, it's uh, always good to see you, brother. On the inside, you're thinking, I want to slug you, brother. <laughs> Come on, we're just being a little honest and a little real here. And so 
David said, you know what? I've got to understand something. It's not just about my actions. How many of you know so much, sometimes we just try behavior modification? We've got to change our behavior. I want to tell you something. Behavior doesn't truly change until you change what's on the inside. And so David's crying out and, and saying Let's, this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Church, can I share this with you this morning? I believe it's the same heart cry for you and I. Lord, let the words of my mouth the meditation, what I meditate on, what I think on. God, not just what I do. God, I, just, I don't want people just to see me and think that I'm, I look good and I'm doing the right things. Amen. Have you ever been in a place where if someone knew what was going on the inside of you, you felt like they would reject you, push you away? Because you look good on the outside. I mean, you got yourself done up for church. I'm wearing the right church shirt. <laughs> Jesus changes everything. And on the inside, you're going, my inside hasn't been changed yet. There's a mess going on the inside of me. Church, God wants to reset our minds back to being renewed in, in Christ. Now listen, it's not just a, a challenge for you. I talked to you the, this morning. Uh, one of my all-time favorite Psalms is not Psalm 100, not Psalm 23, but it's Psalm 77. I know very few people have that, uh, any of it even memorized. Um, I believe it's one of the most real Psalms in the Word of God. It's by a guy by the name of Asaph. He probably was mad at his mama after being old enough to know what his name was. But uh, <laughs> Asaph is his, his name, and he's, uh, uh, you, you got to understand who he is. This is a Levite who is one of the top three guys under David's command. When they brought back the ark, he was one of, they had the, the one gentleman who was the, the main guy, and then Asaph was named as his right-hand man. There was another one named as the left. And he was in charge of the praise and worship that went on day and night in what was being set up in Jerusalem by David. In fact, if you read on in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, you'll see that Asaph was actually one of the ones named who brought in the music when Solomon rededicated the temple. Remember that time where they, they brought in all the praisers and worshipers and they had one set of Levites on one side and another with horns on the other side. And they, when, they, when they brought forth the praise, the Bible says that the cloud of glory fell upon the place. It was so thick that the priest could not even minister in the place. You know who was named as leading that? That was Asaph in 2 Chronicles 5. tells us that he was the one who did that. Now, Psalm 77 is a psalm of Asaph. So you got to remember, this is a brother who has seen some things in his life. I mean, he has seen the presence of God. He's seen the glory of God fall. He's been in a place where very few worship leaders have been in their lives. They have sensed the tangible presence of God. And Asaph goes on, and you've got to listen to this because he comes into a very hard time, a dark time of his life, and he writes this psalm. Here's what he says, Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I searched out on out untiring hands or stretched out untiring hands and my soul refused to be comforted i remember you oh god and i groaned i mused and my spirit grew faint don't you understand why i love this psalm so much you're all looking at me like what in the world see you're talking about somebody who's seen incredible things who's been a part of amazing moves of god but still is subject to depression and discouragement. Come on, can we just be honest for a second? Just because you've been in phenomenal services doesn't mean that you always walk in victory. Can we just be real with this? Sometimes we go through real struggles in our lives. Sometimes we go through places where if somebody knew what our thoughts were, forget about them being acceptable to God. They wouldn't be acceptable to some folks in the world because there's a mess that's going on on the inside of us. And so he goes on and he says this, you kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years long ago. I remember my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? 
Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld his compassion? Selah. Let's stop and meditate on that. God, where are you? Aren't you merciful at all to me anymore? Don't you remember your promise? You're supposed to be the God who's faithful and abounding in mercy. You fulfill your promises and God, I don't see them. When I think about you, even my insides groan, God. In other words, what's he saying? God, at this moment, I don't want anything to do with you. You ever been there? See, what we've got to do is stop pretending, church, and recognize that there are times that not only are we hurting, but those around us are hurting. You may be sitting next to people today who are going through things you have no idea of. And so when we come together in prayer times, sometimes we'll end times at the, the end of service, we'll have ministers up here. And there's so many people who've said to me through the years, you know, I wanted to come for prayer, but I was almost afraid to say what was on my heart because I would be judged. Can we take a weapon out of the hands of the enemy today? And understand that as Christians, it's time to stop judging one another when we walk through difficult times of life. Yes, we've accepted the Lord. Yes, we've walked in times of glory. We've walked in times of victory. But can we be honest with one another to bear each other's burdens where we reach out and say, you know what? I need somebody right now to join with me and pray with me because this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm battling through. And sometimes, like Asaph did, you get to a time where you say, you know, to be honest, I'm not really even battling it right now. Right now, I'm just living it. This is where I am. And, but I know it's not where I should be, but the honesty is it's where I am. And can I share this with you? The way to true freedom is not hiding your feelings or hiding your sin from God, but it's coming before God, falling on our knees and say, God, here I am. This is the mess that's in my heart right now. God, this is the mess that's in my mind. Lord, I need you like never before and crying out to God with truth in our hearts. Do we allow ourselves to be truthful with God, to be honest with ourselves and honest with God? Now, here's what Asaph begins to do, because you've probably wondered why I love this psalm so much. You're thinking, man, you like people in depression? I want you to see what comes next. You ready for this? Let's read the, the next verses. So we, we've see lot over his depression now. And we're now in verse 10. He says this. Then I thought. Some of your translations will say, but then I stopped myself. And I thought, to this will I appeal. Or this will I remember. Or this will I call to my mind. The years of the right hand of the Most High. For I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your deeds. Your ways, O oh Lord, they are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Joseph. And he goes from a place of depression to a place of praise because he said, I refuse to stay thinking on where I've been. I refuse to stay with my mind down and under in the mud. I, I'm turning my mind right now. I'm saying as of this moment, I will reset my mind by saying I choose to remember my God. Saints of God, choose to remember your God this day. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, see, when I choose, when I make a decision to do what we read in Philippians, when I set my mind on oh my God, something begins to change on the inside. Something begins to change in the atmosphere on the inside of me. Number one, my perspective begins to change. See, Asaph's perspective began to change 
because he began to change what he, what he set his mind on. Where before he's, he's looking at what his condition is right now, he now remembers his God and, and he's, he's staying in that place or he's moving away from that place where he's just wallowing in despair. Has anything ever happened in your life to change your perspective? You, you, you may have had di different things. Have you ever felt sorry for yourself and then you came across somebody who was in really bad shape? You thought, you know what? It's not so bad. I think I can make it through today. My perspective has changed. And a couple of times in my life when my perspective changed, a number of years ago when I traveled to, uh, to India, it was a life perspective changing for me. I was with uh, Bishop Spurgeon with uh, um, Reverend Sudarshan, and they took me to a leper colony there in India. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know that leper colonies still existed. I thought it was biblical times. And as the people shuffled out, many of them missing fingers, many of them missing toes, and shuffled out with the largest smiles on their faces, just happy that someone would come to visit them. They stood there and greeted us and encouraged us. And I tell you, you go in thinking that you've got some challenges in your life. You walk out of a leper colony, your perspective has been changed. And your perspective, suddenly you recognize that, you know what? My challenges aren't that bad after all. It's a little perspective change. I remember being down in Haiti just before the big earthquake. And I remember being with a medical missionary and a woman come in with her, her son just near death. And with uh, her holding her in her arms and I'm trying to put little things of fluid in his mouth. The, the em, uh, emergency gentleman looked at her and said, you have to get this boy to a hospital in 48 hours or he'll be gone. And she looked and she said, I cannot. He said, you have to understand, ma'am, that your child, I don't have to tell you this, but will not survive the next 48 hours. And she looked at her child, looked back at us, and sh shrugged her shoulders and said, I have six more, and laid down her son. See, that changes my perspective. Walking through things where I think are, are challenges, and you meet people with, real challenges going on in their life, begins to, to change your perspective. But listen to this, sometimes we wait for folks in harder places or bad things to change our perspective. I believe God wants to give us a different way today where it's not just the evils of this world that change our perspective. You can look around and see the things that happened this week and it can give you a fresh perspective or a, a new outlook on life. But instead of waiting for evil things to take place, to change our perspective, can I tell you this morning that there is a different way. We can begin to take the things that are pure and that are lovely, that are praiseworthy, that are noble, the things of God and begin to set every single day to take up our cross and say, today I live with my mind reset on God. Today I'm going to set my mind on things, not of the mess of this world, but today I choose God in my life. Lord, today I choose and declare that